right, so last time we talked about that enzymes, what they did was they lowered the activation energy, which is sort of this hump that a reaction needs to get over in order to get started. Even a reaction that's favorable, that has a negative delta G, products have less energy than the reactants. This reaction gives off energy, so this is a favorable reaction, but it may not happen, or it may happen extremely slowly because of this hump. You have to get that kickstart to get it going. And what enzymes do is they lower that. So we're going to talk today about how they go about doing that. So first of all, enzymes are proteins, uh, meaning your cell's DNA has the code for making enzymes. A lot of genetic disorders are actually um, disorders with enzymes, enzymes that don't work properly. They are catalysts that are organic. Remember, organic just means they have carbon, and catalyst is anything that speeds up a reaction. But what makes enzymes different than, say, a match, which can spark a reaction to go, is that the enzymes themselves are not consumed or used up by the reaction. So an enzyme can basically break down something um, into products and then go back and grab another one and grab another one and grab another one. Whereas if you light a match, you use it once and it's done. And then again, the way that they work is they lower the activation energy. So in a graph, this hump, this activation energy, enzymes would do this. They would make it lower. Now the reaction can happen more easily. Remember, we can add heat, and that would speed up a reaction a lot of times because heat would add in this activation energy and get the reaction going. Uh, but heat is general. It would speed up everything, plus heat can damage your cells. So enzymes are very specific. The thing that the enzyme reacts with is called the substrate. Think of the substrate as the reactant in a chemical reaction. So the thing on the left of the arrow that we've been calling the reactant, that's going to be the substrate for the enzyme. And when the enzyme and the substrate get together, they form what's called the enzyme-substrate complex. The active site is the area of the enzyme where the substrate actually binds. And we usually draw enzymes even though they don't look like Pac-Man. We kind of draw them looking like Pac-Man. This would be like the active site, and this would be the substrate, and it would bind to that active site. Now, um, we describe the model of how they work. It's called the induced fit model because they fit their substrate. To induce means to cause something to happen. And it's almost like when the enzyme and the substrate get together, they cause each other to change shape a little bit and fit even better. The old model used to be called lock and key. And some like textbooks simplify it and still describe it as kind of like a lock and a key. But here's the thing. If you think about a lock and a key, the key to your house, yes, it goes into the lock and it's specific. It only fits your lock and probably not your neighbor's house's, you know, lock. Um, and enzymes are specific like that. But a key does not change its shape. You literally turn the key and the key keeps its shape and the lock keeps its shape and then the door opens. Enzymes aren't like that. A better example of how an enzyme works would be think about a glove. You know, a glove, when it's not on your hand, is kind of shaped like your hand, but not quite. When you put your hand in the glove, your hand and the glove mold together, and they, they sort of shape around each other. It's an induced fit that the glove molds to your hand. And that's what happens with the enzyme and the substrate. They're bendable and flexible, and they mold and attach to each other, and they each change shape a little bit. Now... How do enzymes actually lower activation energy? You need to understand what they actually do. So one of the things they can do is they can orient the substrates correctly. What does that mean? Well, let's say that in order for this substrate to react with this one, let's just say that the goal of this is that these hook together. But if I just put a bunch of these in a bag and I shake it up, it may not have very many of them react because in order for them to react, they have to line up perfectly. This one has to be facing this way. This one has to be facing this way. So if I just put a bunch in a bag, we might not get much of a reaction. But imagine that you had an enzyme and that the way that enzyme works, so this is my enzyme, and let's say that what this enzyme does is it actually holds these two substrates in the right position. So it hooks onto to piece number one here, it hooks on to piece number two here, and now these substrates are in the perfect alignment to react. That reaction is going to happen a lot faster. So if I added enzymes to the bag, it would make this reaction happen much faster than if I had to rely on the substrates happening to bump into each other the right way. Another thing an enzyme can do is it can strain the bonds on the substrate. Think of it this way. If I have a rubber band and I leave it out in the sun, it'll get brittle and it'll eventually break. 
But imagine I take that rubber band and I stretch it between two nails and put it out in the sun. I bet it'll break a lot sooner because you've created stress on it that's going to cause it to break more easily. Well, enzymes can do that too. You might have an enzyme that binds to the substrate and what it actually does when it binds to that substrate, um, you know, so here's my enzyme and here's my substrate, is it actually sort of molds it and twists it and it causes stress. And that stress causes the substrate to break apart. Now, could that substrate break apart on its own? Yes, but maybe in order for that to happen, it has to bump into another one in just the right way to cause it to sort of crack in half. So the enzyme, by causing stress on the substrate, allows it to break more easily. A third thing enzymes can actually do is sometimes they're much, much bigger in reality than their substrate. Sometimes it binds to the substrate and it literally creates an environment around the substrate where it can react better. Maybe the pH is different in this environment, or maybe it's a hydrophobic environment, or whatever it is. So in order for the substrate to normally react, it needs to have a certain set of conditions, and this little area where the substrate binds to the enzyme creates the perfect set of conditions. And finally, it can actually bind to the substrate. It can actually form temporary bonds, and if it forms covalent bonds with the substrate, that may cause the substrate, when it bonds to the enzyme, to basically break or, or change into its product. So this is how enzymes actually lower activation energy. They set up a situation where you don't need so much energy to get the reaction started. Now you only need a little bit, and now the reaction can occur more, fa uh, more quickly and at a normal temperature. Here's a picture of, of what an enzyme would really look like, and notice how induced fit, it bends and flexes around the substrate. The enzyme and the substrate technically both change shape a little bit. And then the substrate could be stretched so it can break more easily. Um, it could have an environment around it where it can react more easily. But the bottom line is the substrate can turn into product more easily than it would on its own because the enzyme sets up an environment that favors forming the product. And here's another one. This one kind of shows the idea of an enzyme aligning them properly. So there's your enzyme in an active site. You need to be able to label the active site on an enzyme, the substrate, the product, the enzyme substrate complex, all of that on a picture. Um, so here's our substrates. Now, in order for these substrates to react, they have to line up just right. If I put a bunch of these in a bag and I shake them up, maybe some of them will hit in the right position, but a lot of them will probably hit the wrong way and they won't be able to become product. So the enzyme is actually holding them in the exact perfect position where they can react with each other. And now they become product, the product is released, and the enzyme, remember, is reusable. So this picture really shows in a nice way, even though um, they're not going to probably be pointy like that, it really shows in a really nice way how the enzyme, in this case, is speeding up the reaction. The reactants are just held in a position where they can react more easily than if we had to rely on them bumping into each other on their own. All right, enzymes, as far as naming, this is not always true, but a little heads up that if you see ACE at the end of a word, it's telling you it's an enzyme. I would say on the AP exam, you're going to see lots of words you don't recognize. They use really big words. They use the real names of things. For example, this is an enzyme, adenylyl cyclase. You don't have to know what it does. You don't have to be able to pronounce it or spell it. But if you see ACE, you know it's an enzyme. And you can just go, oh, okay, they're giving me an enzyme. And then you're going to know, uh, you know, in the, in the scheme of the experiment, what the job probably is of adenylyl cyclase. You can figure it out. So if you see ACE, it's just a heads up that that is a, a common ending for enzymes. Okay, things that affect enzyme reactions. The first thing that will affect um, how quickly a reaction happens is the concentration of substrate. Remember, substrate's the thing the enzyme's breaking down. So imagine you have 10 enzymes, um, and they're all just sort of sitting here waiting for substrates and you start adding in some substrate. Well, the more substrate you add, the enzyme is going to work faster because you're going to get more of these enzymes involved. But eventually you're going to get to a point where every single enzyme is already working as fast as it can. And when you get to that point, it's called being saturated. It means the enzymes are working as fast as they can. And if you add more substrate, it's not going to make the enzyme go any faster. This substrate is just going to be sitting there waiting. And a good example of this is what happens when somebody drinks alcohol. If they drink a little bit of alcohol, it goes to their liver, the enzymes break it down. They drink a little more, the enzymes, more enzymes are activated and they keep breaking it down. 
But eventually, if they drink too much, what's going to happen is all their enzymes are saturated. They're working as fast as they can. Well, the rest of that alcohol, while it's waiting, is traveling through the blood and going to the brain and then causing the effects that someone has when they're, they're buzzed or they get drunk or whatever. And basically, they're going to stay buzzed or drunk or whatever until these enzymes finish their job and have time to get to the ones that are basically waiting. And so that's what happens when an enzyme is saturated. If it's overpowered, it's not going to work any faster. And I have a graph I'm going to show you this. Another thing you should know is that as the um, enzymes run out of reactant, the reaction is going to slow down. You're actually going to see this in the lab. When you first start ripping papers, you're going to have little papers A, B, and you're the enzyme, so you're ripping them in half. Well, when you first start, your bag is going to have 50 of these papers. But after you've ripped most of them, and when you rip them into A and B, you're putting those back in the bag. So by the end of this experiment, and you've ripped 49 of these, you're going to have one paper and a whole bunch of product. Finding that last paper is going to take some time. So as the reaction progresses, if the product is building up, this is going to slow the reaction down. And so near the end, the enzymes are not going to be working at their maximum rate because it's going to be harder for them to find unreacted substrates. So you need to be familiar with this graph. This graph is showing on the x-axis substrate concentration. In other words, the reactive. And they're giving us more and more and more. And this is some particular enzyme. And this is the rate, how fast the enzyme is working. And notice what I said, that as we add more substrate, the enzyme can work faster. But notice how it plateaus here. This is where the enzyme is saturated. That means that the enzyme is working as fast as it can. And this would be pretty much the maximum. They have sort of a dotted line here. But this is the fastest the enzyme can possibly work. In other words, at that rate, every enzyme is working. And even if I added 5,000 molecules for the enzyme to react with, it wouldn't go any faster. It would still work at the same rate. These molecules would just be sitting around waiting for enzyme to get to them. Um, so you need to be familiar with this graph and know that when it plateaus, that means the enzyme is saturated. And what does that mean? It means the enzyme is working at its maximum speed, its fastest rate. You could speed this up if you added more enzyme. Remember, the enzymes are like the workers. So if I added 100 more enzymes to the bag, I could do this. Because now I would have more workers and the enzyme wouldn't be saturated anymore. It could work at a faster rate. But once all the enzymes are busy, this reaction isn't going to go any faster. Another thing that will affect enzymes is temperature. Temperature, enzymes have what's called an optimum temperature. It's different for every enzyme. If the temperature gets too high, though, it can denature the enzymes. And you need to know what that means. That means they unfold. That means, and this goes back to chapter two, it never really goes away completely, this biochemistry stuff. It means that their secondary and their tertiary structures are no longer the same. So instead of the enzyme being folded up into that perfect shape with an active site, it unfolds or, or whatever, and now the enzyme can't do its job. Sometimes if you change the temperature or the pH, you denature the enzymes. And again, this is specific to different enzymes. Most human enzymes work best. Their, their optimum temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. That's our body temperature. If you raise the temperature much higher than that, you denature them. This is why fevers are so dangerous. Because if a person has a really high fever, 104, 105, degrees uh, Fahrenheit, I don't know what that is in Celsius, probably 42, something like that, uh, basically the enzymes start to be denatured, which means every job that's going on in your body that's relying on enzymes, and that's a lot of jobs, including important ones in your brain, those jobs stop, and you can actually die uh, from a high temperature. Even if they get it down, it may be too late. Um, but enzymes in bacteria that live in hot springs may work best at much higher temperatures. Also, Enzymes have an optimum pH. Again, this varies. Pepsin works best at pH of 2. That's why your stomach has a low pH. It actually activates the enzyme. And trypsin, one in your intestine, works best at 8. You're not going to be tested on memorizing those enzymes. You just need to know enzymes have an optimal pH. Don't waste your time going, Pepsin works at 2, Pepsin works at 2. That's not going to help you on any test. But it would help you on a test if I asked you from a graph, hey, would uh, Pepsin work at a pH of 5. So you go to this graph, find 5. No, pepsin doesn't work at 5. Would pepsin work at 3? Yes, it's not its optimum. If I said, what's the optimum for pepsin? You would say, oh, about 2. So you need to be able to do that. 
on a test.